Um, first of all, just some, this is really a Woodlot Management 101 course. We did a pre-conference workshop where we all people and we went through the Woodlot Management 101 and all the way up to 301 and some, some of the more technical aspects of things. But one of the first questions that people usually ask is why should I manage a sugar bush? Like what is management and why should I do it? And because if you just buy a, a, a Woodlot around here or anywhere and it's got maples in it, you know, you're, you know that sap is going to flow from sugar maple, so it doesn't matter if it's managed or not. Um, the other thing is that careful management does take time, it does take money, it does take equipment, and so maybe the easiest thing to do is just tap the bush and get the sap out of it. The other thing is that um, trees, maple is one of the most forgiving trees species to work with. It's very uh, plastic, it, it, it grows across a wide range of site. It responds well to any kind of release treatments. It's very, um, it throws out abundant seed, so you can always count on some kind of new regeneration at some point in the future. Other species in the woods aren't so forgiving, so if, if you want to manage maple, it's uh, it's the right tree to manage. But the benefits aren't always immediate. Uh, sometimes it takes 10 or 20 years for you to see the improvements that you made by thinning and you know getting that tree ready for tapping. And then the other flip side of that is that mistakes can be costly. If you choose the wrong tree, or if you cut too hard, or if you, if you do things that um, that aren't quite that nature doesn't agree with, that can get you. So the benefits then are the flip side of all of that. So the benefits include faster growth, and I'll get into each one of these in more detail. Um, because maple has the ability to respond. If it has a kind of a narrow crown and you provide that crown room to grow, the crown quickly fills in those, those, those canopy gaps that you've left. So that means faster growth. Uh, it also means more sap per tap. We did a study in Lanark County here about 20 years ago where we did controlled plots and managed plots and we had separate pipelines going each in, and each one going into a separate dump tank. So we could actually measure the volumes coming off of the control versus the managed plot. And we were noticing about a 20% increase from the managed plots than we were from the unmanaged plots. There is uh, some evidence about sweeter sap as well, it's just because you got more foliage, which is producing more carbohydrates, which is producing then more sucrose, which is then sweeter. Uh, you also have um, a healthier forest. You're removing trees that are dead, dying, and diseased, or you're removing other species which um, aren't compatible with your sugar bush management objectives. And if you're lucky enough, as you remove some of these trees from your forest, you can actually produce firewood, produce lumber, produce other products, and, and sell those. So the bottom line of all of that is that you're, you're starting to work towards a sustainable um, sugar bush. So let's dive into this uh, faster growth thing a little bit more. Um, so on the left hand side, tree A, um, DVH is 11 inches. I, I, I'm going to work in imperial units if that's okay. I might slip into metric every once in a while, but I'm sure you guys can figure that one out. 11 inches are tapping rules, guidelines say minimum 10 inches for tapping, so that's a tappable tree. Age is 50, number of taps is 1. Tree B came from another bush. Uh, its DBH is eight inches and it's um, 24 years older, and so there's no taps. So you can see, first of all, age doesn't matter in sugar maple; it's size. Uh, but the faster you can get that tree into into tapping range, uh, the better it is for you. And uh, the other thing you can see here is that the tree is also putting on lots of good white uh, wood, which is your Conductive tissues for maple for, for sap production. So the faster growth. Also, um, you could, this is just another example of it, but here's the money side of things. A five inch tree in an unmanaged forest would take 65 years to grow to 10 inches in diameter. And uh, whereas in the managed forest, it would only take 29 years to get to a 10 inch diameter tree. So, and that's all depending on site and everything, but it just shows you uh, that you give that tree room to grow, it's going to respond, it's going to get bigger diameter, bigger crowns. And all that means you can tap it sooner and that tree will yield more sap over the course of your management of that tree. 
Here's a little bit of data that we had on, on that managed versus unmanaged in terms of sap yield. A managed uh, sugar bush is producing two liters of tap more uh, per, of sap per tap than an unmanaged blend one. So when you start cutting out, and we'll get into this in later slides, the toughest thing for a major manager is to cut out a maple tree. You're looking at it going, oh, I think I can hang on to that one. I can get a tap in there. It's almost a false economy because if you, you take out the trees that are, you know, intermediate in, in terms of growth performance or have some health issues, they're actually hogging room that your better trees could use and will expand. And it's, you'll get more taps off of that big tree than you would if you tried to get it. So that's, that's the bottom line for this. Is you make trees need room to grow and you have to figure out how much room and uh, which trees to keep. So getting into that, what, what's, the, what's the trees to remove? Um, there's a lot of, of documents on this. I've got some of the documents out here. Um, you know, some really good uh, products that show the types of tree diseases and everything. Uh, some of these other guides that were produced in the 80s, um, when we had concerns about acid rain and pear thrips and sugar bush management, they've got good color plates on there and all the different problems that you might run into. But one of the best ones is um, this one that was produced about 10 years ago and locally here by the Eastern Ontario Mall, of course. It's probably the most complete guide on sugar bush management uh, that you can find. Uh, but I'll make a plug for uh, John Williams at Omspot because he brought a whole box of the new USDA that maple syrup produced in England. So the, the first version of that was 1960 and it was really focused in on the production side of things trying to get people to develop or adhere to some quality standards, adhere to uh, some tapping standards, trying to get the industry up to a new uh, level and um, improve from there. Then that got updated in the early 90s, lots more colored pictures, but also about three more pages on sugar bush management here. But you can see the size of this book and there's three pages on sugar bush management. So even back then, it was more or less an afterthought because they're focusing in on the quality of how to keep your sap fresh, how to make sure you've got good quality, good flavors, that kind of thing. But the newest version is just out, and that's one that John Williams <coughs> brought here to the conference. And I think he's got them for sale here, but you can also buy it off the Omsco website. And just like on the trend, one page on sugar bush management in here, three in here, there's about six pages of sugar bush management in the new manual. So Either we're just saying the same thing in more words, or there's actually new information. But uh, all of you will recognize some of these problems. Um, you, you can see, these are just uh, sketches of it, but you can see the different problems. You've got diseases, you've got fungus, you've got uh, windstorm, ice storm damage trees. Nature has a way of culling and thinning out the forest on its own, um, whether you're going to do it or not. Not every tree that ever you know, sprouted from a seed is ever going to mature into a mature tree. So what we're trying to do is influence that. We're going to be the manager. We're going to cho choose the trees that are the winners and, 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 and remove the ones that are interfering with that. The last little picture over here shows uh, cattle grazing in the woodlot. And it wasn't that long ago that that was the standard for sugar bush management. Uh, the, the, the woodlots were summer pasture for cattle. They were kicked out of the fields while the hay was growing and before you cut the hay, so they have to go forage in the woodlot. And uh, they love sugar bushes, and the maple producers at the time loved that too because they were all in pockets. And there wasn't a single piece of regen or anything in the forest to trip over, so you could send your kids in there to get buckets and they would likely not spill them on the way down. But that's kind of not what we're trying to achieve today with pipeline systems. We're trying to make sure that there's trees of all ages and all uh, size classes, and um, don't let paddle into your woodlot anymore. I think that's a thing of the past, although there's a guy in Charlotte Lake that still does it, and I take pictures of it, because I want <laughs> just to show people what not to do. Um, so what problems should you watch for? Um, there's four problems that you should look for in the, in the, in the sugar bush. Uh, they're into these classes, operational, the diseases, the environmental, and the insects, and we'll get into that a bit more. Uh, on the operational, uh, it really is about your own infrastructure. As you put in pipeline systems, you've got wires, you've got anchor trees, you've got everything. 
you can see that uh, your infrastructure and your trail network will have an impact on sugar bush health and the types of maples you will leave behind. And sometimes it's unavoidable. You need an anchor tree for your pipeline system. If that happens to be a maple, great. Um, but uh, if you can avoid attaching all your pipelines to maple trees, that's even better. Um, so on the environmental side of things, uh, we don't have to go too far in the past in this part of the country to, to find examples of this. Um, this past April, we had an ice storm. Uh, most of the producers in Lanark County were out of power for two or three days, which was right at the wrong time because it was peak sap flow. But we also lost a lot of branches. A lot of white pine especially was damaged and it came down and crashed down on pipelines. But a lot of maples that had high defects were also affected. So we were losing uh, crowns, they were splitting in half, or, or trees were breaking off at some of the canker spots and everything. But last year, uh, May 21st or May 22nd, I can't uh, remember what it was. 21st. Pardon? 21st. 21st. It's 3 p.m. It's in your mind. 3, 3 p.m. I think 3 10. <laughs> so, and then by what, 22nd, you're out with your skitter. Yeah, it was a mess. We had the Duresho come through here, and anybody who hasn't experienced the Duresho, it really is just a series of small downbursts, and it just kind of choked its way across the countryside. There were some embedded tornadoes in it, but for this part of the world, it was mostly the downbursts, and it was just poof, 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 and it would take out three acres, four acres, carry on, and your neighbor's bush, you know, 100 meters away could be absolutely fine. But it seemed, and maybe this is my own opinion, if you had a sugar bush, that wind, wind went looking for it, and it went, oh, there's a sugar bush, boom. There's a <laughs> so um, it took us in our sugar bush about two full months to clean up from that, and we're not even done. We just got rid of the stuff that was in the way. So that there's an example. There was a lot of root tip over, a lot of crown breakage. And my observation on that was that anybody who was around in the 1998 ice storm, uh, we had a lot of crown breakers in, and, and the trees seemed to recover. You know, we, it was a bit of a disaster for a couple of years, but then, like I said, maple crowns do respond to growing conditions. But there was a lot of high rot and high defect up in those trees, and the same thing happened in pine. They, they broke off their tops, and then side branches took over, they got a new top. Well, guess what? When the Duresho came through, where did all the damage occur that wasn't a tipped over tree? It was at exactly the same place on the tree where the ice storm had damaged that tree in 1998. So trees don't care, nature doesn't care. If it takes me 20 years to get that tree on the ground, nature says, I'll, I'll take it. So what you're trying to do is avoid that. You're trying to develop solid, healthy trees that don't have defects. It, and will it save you from a derecho? Probably not, but if on lighter winds and on ice storms, it may provide more solid structure for your crowns and therefore you won't have to spend all your time cleaning up. Uh, on the insect side of things, we're pretty fortunate in, in maple management. Um, the one that has, it's always in the background is maple borer. That's the one up on the top left here. It's a boring, wood boring insect and it, 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 it's not very prevalent, but when you find it, you can find it in a lot of trees. And it cuts across horizontally across the stem, so it doesn't girdle the tree, but it cuts off half of the conductive tissue on that side of the tree. So then, I wish I had a pointer, uh, then that wound will heal over, but you can always see it, and it produces a white face scar. The wood underneath is usually pretty solid. But obviously, there's no conductive tissue on that side of the tree, so it limits your tapping choices. You're now forced to be tapping only on the back of the tree. It's also a structural weakness, so that if you do that, have that higher up on the crown, um, it'll snap off there. So that's almost uh, when you're in your decision as to what to keep, what to cut. If you have maple borer damage on the tree, it's usually it. You may as well get rid of it now because it's not going to get better. Forest 10 caterpillar, again back in the world, 2016, 17, 18. We had complete defoliation, 100% defoliation of hardwoods. And uh, they, forest 10 caterpillar, seemed to target uh, sugar maple. Um, some of the maple producers around here actually organized aerial spraying to, to kill these pests, but it's more cyclical. It's a native pest, and there's things that catch up to it. So the spraying was really just about 
holding on to your trees, knowing that the collapse of the population will come. So the, the forest tank caterpillar did collapse in its population in 2019, but guess who was ready to take over? And that was the gypsy moth, or now called the spongy moth. That came in in 2019, and so the, all those same hardwood trees that had been foliated from 2016 to 19, then were impacted by gypsy moth from 2019 to 2022. Again, that population collapsed. But all of that has an impact on your forest health and has an impact on how well your trees will produce sap. Without foliage, you're not going to get sap. Yeah, Martin? I, I did the math. You know, I was one of the producers, Eric, that, uh, that sprayed. I know your end of the lake at Fagan Lake was very, very badly impacted. Yeah. Um, I did the math, and basically I figured if I got 0.1% better sap the following spring, it justified me spraying the, the cost. I think we were... 90 acres, it costs $4,000. Yeah, just for people and, and, and there's really no way you can do it other than hiring a contractor that has a helicopter <coughs> fixed wing. Uh, luckily, the contractors were there and they're available. I think they've uh, decided that working with private landowners after the gypsy moth experience, <laughs> so you won't see them around for a while, but um, it's not a sustainable business model for them to be available to private landowners <coughs> once every 20 years you might need to spray. So, I'm hoping that if we get back into the cycle of these defoliated insects again, that the support will be there, just as Marty said, that we can uh, we can spray if needed. You don't necessarily need to spray, but if you don't, you know, you have to understand that without foliage, the trees are not producing the same kind of sugars. Uh, there might be sap next year. It'll probably be lower quality sap, uh, weaker sap. And you might want to adjust your tapping rule, um, tap less, if you had two taps on a tree before you peel back to one, if you had one, you, you give it a rest for a year as the trees recover. Uh, you know, we always put this saddle prominent uh, as one of the, the key insects of maple. Um, and, and my entire life around here, 30 years, 35 years in the Woodlots, Atlantic County, I've only ever seen two saddle prominent. And I don't mean two outbreaks, I mean two bugs. So it's not a big one, but who knows, maybe Bruce County, Waterloo County is more prevalent out there, so pay attention. But there's lots of books on what bugs are out there trying to get you. On the canker side of things, uh, these are all must-cut trees in, in sugarbush management. So we've got Utapella canker and Nectar canker. They're those big, bulgy things that you see on your trees. And it's tough, I know, because uh, on the back side of that tree, it's usually a pretty good looking tree, and sometimes they, they hide on you. And look at the back side, oh, there's a nice keeper, and then you go around the front, it's like, oh, it's got one of those. The biggest issue with those is that uh, it's quite a virulent fungus. Uh, it produces a lot of spores, and it infects not trees of the same size as where the spores are being produced, but it affects all of your young saplings. So if you go and look at any regeneration that you've got, you're likely going to find a lot of Utapella canker on that. And that's nature's way of thinning out the abundance of that region. Um, we did a plantation at the Fortune Farms where I work. Jamie's doing a presentation on it later on. But we dug up a lot of saplings and transplanted them out in the field. About 15% of them, we didn't know it, you couldn't see it at the time, had Utapella canker on them. So we, we moved a diseased tree into the um, plantation. Of course, that then didn't be it. So watch for that. But for me, in a mature sugar bush, those two are musk cuts. Over on the far right, the stem decay, that's usually an indication of the tree is well past its prime. That's usually, uh, if you're tapping it when you're drilling, you can't find any white wood. You've drilled one hole, it comes out as stained wood. You go around the backside, another hole, stained wood. You know that tree is pretty much done. The fungus usually takes hold in, the, in an old tap wound or in some kind of scar. So when you see that on a tree, it's a, it's a must cut. It's not going to produce you any sap. It's just taking up room. Okay, so those are the, that's a background on all this. So what is sugar bush management? And it's any activity uh, in the sugar bush that changes the forest to meet your desired goal. As sugar producers, you're trying to get to more maple, more healthier maple, and less of the trees that you can have. It involves assessing the health of the forest, as I've been talking about, but also of the individual trees. You actually have to get down to a tree-by-tree -tree decision at some point to decide if that tree is going to stay or go. Always best to develop a plan and then implement it. 
I say that every single time, but I know the reality. Like, uh, you, you have a plan, you can put it on paper, and then nature comes along and does something else. So all that defoliation I talked about, uh, between the gypsy moth and the forest and caterpillar, I lost maybe about 40 of my 150 year age lost trees. They just didn't recover. They just said, that's it, I'm done. So what am I doing? I'm going to cut those trees down and recover the wood products and maybe not do the, uh, the, the tending that I wanted to do earlier. So have a plan and understand what nature is doing when you have to deviate. Uh, you want to identify your crop trees. I'm going to call those keepers and remove the high risk or other trees. Always in the sugar bush, um, you want to uh, work safely and don't damage the residual trees. We had a discussion about this in the workshop the other day. This is the absolute wrong time of year to be in the sugar bush doing any kind of management. The trees are actively growing. Um, they're putting on new wood and as a result of that the bark is very thin and, and loose around that wood and any kind of damage, any kind of bumping by a tractor or equipment or if you fell a tree and a branch kind of skins down the side of another tree, that's going to remove the bark off of that tree which is probably one of the ones you've identified as a keeper. So avoid that. The best time is after September but for me the best time is even uh, you know, just after deer hunting season, you've got about a two month window there before the snow gets deep. That's an ideal time to do your management. The other advantage is you can see what you're doing. In full leaf condition, your bush looks completely different than in leaf off condition. So you're trying to figure out which way to fell a tree. You can't really tell in full leaf condition because everything's kind of, you can't see where the crown might go and where it might hit. So uh, I like the leaf off condition for sugar bush management. Uh, just on the biodiversity and wildlife habitat side of things, it, this is the exact time of year too that all the mammals are having their young and all the birds are having their young. So just, you know, we're pretty busy in the sugar bush year round, but this is a good time of year not to be in the sugar bush. I, it's it's, it's kind of nicely timed with fishing season as well. So, you know, put the stuff away, clean up your stuff, get the evaporator put away, go fishing for a while, and then think about sugar bush management again come fall. Oh, uh, one thing you can't see on here, I'll have to raise this a bit, is uh, one of the targets, and this is just a general rule of thumb, from uh, how much maple should you have in your, in your maple sugar bush. Uh, the target is for about 75% maple and 25% other compatible species. Is anybody here organic uh, certified for their operation? Isn't this one of the standards that you have to adhere to, Terry? Yeah. Yeah, they want to see biodiversity. Yeah, and 75, 25 is usually what they they ask for, or the as specific as that. I'm kind of lucky. My inspectors don't know a beech tree from an apple. <laughs> <laughs> I just say, yeah, we have it. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, 75, 25 is going to Yeah, yeah. So it, it, biodiversity is a bit of a buzzword. Um, what does it mean? It just means uh, you're, you're trying to manage for your product intention, intention with allowing other things to also exist to coincide. Yeah, uh, by doing this you're actually uh, helping to prevent some of those catastrophic losses that we have through ice storms, wind storms, uh, defoliation because those other species may protect your maples. Um, uh, sometimes if you got oak and maple, well then those bugs are uh, targeting oaks and your maples are collateral damage. So you have to figure that out. But 75, 25 is a good rule of thumb. Uh, just a little bit more about maple, I'm sure you all know this, but it's a uh, it's very good grower in its early ages. So if you see any kind of pulse of regeneration that's happening in the sugar bush, uh, maple puts out good seed crops about every five years. Those seeds, almost 100% of them germinate, and a lot of those form those little uh, maple seedlings that you see in the forest floor. So they are, have the ability to grow and develop to maybe about you know, a half, uh, two foot height before they start to decline because they need full sunlight to continue the development. So um, that's, a, that's a key feature of maple. We're pretty lucky in that it is an abundant seed producer. Other tree species in the woods aren't. And I uh, have to wait for like eight years, 12 years sometimes to <coughs> do seed crops. But maple, maple works with us on that side. Uh, the height growth. Is uh, it starts exactly as soon as buds leaf out, 
It's expanding branches, it's expanding its crown, but the diameter is also expanding at the same time. So the diameter growth is completed within 14 to 17 weeks of that initiation of bud development. So from May, June, July, and August, there's your 17 weeks. By the end of August, all of that growth is basically completed, both the, the crown expansion and the diameter expansion. Um, as I mentioned, maple is classified as a shade tolerant tree and it can, uh, can grow under 25% sunlight, but it actually requires 100% sunlight for it to grow and develop into uh, a sugar maple producing tree. Uh, trees can grow for three to four hundred years, but I think that the, uh, the, the lifespan from a tree and a sugar bush is probably more in the 120 to 130 year class. After that, it's almost time to retire them, even if they're still healthy, they're just not producing as much sap. Um, but your ideal growth is in sap production is from the age of about 35 to that 110. So now we're getting into sugar bush management, and, and the question is, well, how many trees should I have? And this this is where it gets tough. Uh, we spent uh, the whole course uh, uh, before the conference talking about how many, and there's many different ways of looking at that. And it's just basically there's lots of guidelines and, and stocking charts that you can look at. Uh, but the first thing you need to do is do an inventory of your walnut and figure out how many you have to start with. Uh, sometimes when you look at your forest and you you've got a lot more other species that other than maples so you're trying to figure out how many maples you got and what that, what the average spacing is between all those maples um, if you look at some of the guidelines you could be in an understock situation you can have too few maples and sometimes you have too many so depending on where you are in that spectrum your 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 plan is going to change but uh, there's two approaches to deciding uh, which trees to keep and which ones to cut. And the one I'm going to talk about the most, because I think it's the simplest, is um, something called the crop tree management approach. And if you look at the guidelines I talked about, the USDA approach, they, they really have a lot more information on there. But it, it is, uh, there's lots of information on there. But the crop tree approach is basically um, being able to identify what the ideal sugar maple is, figuring out then how many you, of those ideal trees you can have per acre, and then dealing with the trees that are in between them. Um, we'll get into that in detail in a bit more. But uh, the average spacing, believe it or not, if you were to have, if I took everybody's sugar bush and asked how many taps you had per acre, or how many acres of sugar bush you have, and how many taps you have, if you're in that 75% range maple, and I work out the square footage of each maple based on your number of taps per your acre. It magically works out to about 24 feet between trees. And so at the workshop the other day, I laid out a, a tape measure on the, on the parking lot, and we all paced out 24 feet, which is about six or seven paces for the average person. In my, here, oh here, here's my nod to the metric system, six to seven meters. So there you go. Yes, sir. So if we're if so I'm, in a, I'm mucking out a bush right now. Yeah. Okay. And um, there's a lot of small maples in it. And when I say small, I mean over six feet tall. But just but they're they're clumped together. Yeah. So if I go in there and I I cull out those trees, I want them roughly 21 feet apart. We'll get into that in a second, but the. This is about your, how many, how far apart they should be when they get the tappable size. Okay. Uh, there's going to be a, a huge number of trees before they get the tappable size, and and then, and, but depending on where you're intervening, you have to make some choices. But I'll get into that in a second because it, this this technique works if you can picture the 24 foot <coughs> chasing. Yeah, and that's that's based on the fact that your ideal maple producing tree is going to have about 50% of its total height as live foliage. If, it, if it's too crowded, then the crown starts shrinking because there's no room for them to expand. Now you're into 25% or 20% live crown. So those trees might have a nice bowl down there, but there's really no foliage up there to support them. So that's why it's good to look at these things in, in leaf-off condition, because you could say, yeah, these things are poodle tails. That's what I call them. 
So what you're trying to do is through management is to maintain that 50% live crown ratio through all of the growth stages, whether it's a sapling or a polewood or a small tree. And as that tree grows, it needs more room. So uh, that's the final spacing is 24 feet, but you can start doing things as small when it's only six feet tall and start having an impact on that to keep that cram low. And you've seen that, like the ideal sugar maple tree might be one of those old pentro trees, you know, where there's crown right to the ground. Those things produce a ton of sap and the sap's pretty sweet. But they also take up a lot of room. So you're sacrificing total tap per acre by putting them all on fewer trees. And if that tree ever crashes out, well then it's there's three taps gone, not one. So it's all about insurance as well. Um, does everybody know what I mean, mean? Know what I mean when I say even age versus uneven age forest? Very simply, even age forests are all the trees basically started growing at the same time and they all grow together and they're all approximately the same age, even age. Uneven age is where you've got trees of all sizes, all diameters growing in the forest at the same time. And interestingly, the hardwood forest of this part of the world is naturally an uneven aged forest. So that wind event I showed you, that's nature's way of regenerating the forest. It plops down trees in an acre. So that acre now sprouts up as a new age class. Next windstorm, three acres over there. So you've got uneven age forest comprised of even age pockets of regen from those tip overs. But that's, that's a good thing to have in your sugar bush because not all the trees are in the same growth condition. That's your insurance, that's your resilience against other calamities. So, how many trees should I have? So, when we talked about the 24 foot, but what to look for, and being able to get your eye trained as to what a crop tree is, helps. Uh, so, um, think about the best trees you have in your forest. Uh, nice, tall, straight, um, no defect on the stem, 50% live crown. That's, that's your image that you're trying to create. Um, and you can find those in your forest. And, but then you'll look at other trees that look kind of healthy, but they'll have other kinds of defects. They might have high crown forks, um, and uh, those are high risk trees because in any kind of ice storm, if you've got a, a junction that looks like a V, uh, half of that crown is going to split off in the ice storm, or that'll split off in a windstorm. If your crown is more of a U shaped junction, and you can see there's solid wood throughout the whole thing, it's a stronger junction. But we're looking for trees that are growing vigorously. You can probably all got that in your mind. If you see nice pink bark between the ridges of the bark, you know uh, that tree is growing quickly. You should be able to identify what's a good maple site and what isn't. There's maple growing on pretty shallow soils that used to be pine around here or some other species, but they grew in because of the abundance of seed and the pine wasn't there anymore. That doesn't mean that's a great maple site. You just have to know that those trees are growing slowly, they'll still produce sap, but maybe you want to put your investment on the trees that are on the best maple uh, sites, which is good deep soils, well drained, sandy loams, that kind of condition. In forestry, we use two terms, so AGS and UGS. Uh, a lot of the books uh, had that term in there. AGS just means acceptable growing stock. So those are uh, trees that are growing well now and are going to continue to grow well and we're evaluating that over a 20 year time frame. UGS is unacceptable growing stock. It's anything that has one of those obvious stem defects on it or something that you think is going to cause the decline in growth of that tree over that 20 year period. So obviously you're going to discriminate against the UGS trees when you're cutting trees and you're going to favor the AGS trees when you're deciding on what a crop tree is. Uh, it works out kind of well in sugar bush management too because your, your infrastructure, your pipeline system usually has about a 20 year time horizon to your main lines. You're going to be replacing them after 20 years. So every time you take down your main line, that's the time to do sugar bush management. Get the pipeline out of the way, reestablish it after you've done your management. So here's a visual on the crop tree approach. Um, Uh, so on average, I'm going to stand here, 
there's your seven meters, there's your crop tree, there's your crop tree. But they're not always going to be nicely spaced at seven meters. You're not going to find one, you're going to find one at four meters. So that's okay. But what you're trying to do is to get them more or less pegged at that general spacing. Um, maybe you didn't put them at 24 foot spacing, that's you trying to get them there. So you can, you can manage things, but the important thing is that those trees are all AGS trees, they have good healthy crowns, they got no stem defects, and it's easy to mark. You can do that with your buddy, you just set up a grid pattern and just start going and, and talk to each other. What do you see on that side of the tree? I can't see it. That type of thing, you mark your crop trees at that space. Then what you have to do is to give those crop trees room to grow. So this is where you start doing, here's your crop trees from the looking down on them. Here they are after they've been thinned. So what you're gonna do, and this works whether it's a six foot tall tree or a, uh, a 60 foot tall tree. You, you're gonna release that crown on at least two sides. You're gonna look around and see what tree is competing with the crown of that tree I've just designated as a crop tree, because they're, they're competing. They're going to shear off each other's buds in heavy winter winds and all that kind of stuff. So you're trying to remove that competition. So pick the two most impactful trees. If they happen to be a UGS tree or another species, that's an easy choice. If it happens to be another co-dominant maple, that gets a little bit more tricky. But that photograph here, and it's maybe you can't really see it. But here's a crop tree. We always designate crop trees with blue. You can see it's full deep crown. That's at least 40% of the total height of this crown. Uh, as live crown, same over here. Then you've got this guy, which is a very spindly thing that has the same height as your crop tree. But its crown is like very narrow. It's only about 20%. So that's interfering with the growth of both this crop tree and that crop tree. So that's, that's how you decide which trees are going to be. And at the younger six foot age, um, what I tend to do is make sure that I pick those ones at 24 feet and give them a full crown release, like all, you know, maybe a six foot radius around. But don't worry about all the stuff that's in the middle, because it's not going to, it's not interfering with the growth of your crop tree. And that also gives you some insurance in case that thing that you did release gets <coughs> damaged by some other factor. So. You, you just worry about making sure that that long-term crop tree at that 24-foot spacing has room to grow. So if you have a nice cluster of them, like um, <laughs> if there's a nice section where you've got, say, half a dozen or even a dozen of uh, smaller maple trees growing tight together, plan on what it might look like, say, 15, 10 years down the road, pluck them, might, like, Take them out so maybe they're two feet apart. Let them grow for a while. And I, I would I'm giving a little bit more of an aggressive thing than that. So if you're only giving them two feet of room to grow, you'll be back in three years taking oh, another two feet of. So give it give it at, at, it's at that young age class. Give it a good ten foot spacing because like you got lots of trees and you, 24 feet just as a visual. It's one tree in that corner of the room, one tree in that corner of the room, one, one tree in this corner of the room, one tree in that corner of the room. That's, that's a 24 foot spacing right there. All this other stuff, all you guys in the middle, you're there, but you're not the ones I'm investing in. So uh, you want to make sure that the corner trees have got the room to grow. Okay, one, more, one more question, I don't mean to take you off topic. If you have, like, you, you've seen maples where they're, they're, they're fairly decent size, but they're growing up in a, in a cluster of two or three. Yeah. Can you, um, can you take and you, can you cut two of those off and yeah. have one of them grow decently or? Very rarely. So at a younger age class, maybe, like when they're only this diameter, maybe, because you're, you're going to have to have a very small wound of the tree that you've cut off and it might heal over. But the, the general rule is that if that if those three trees share a root system, you have to treat it as one tree. So it's either you leave that whole clump or you take that whole clump. But rarely can you do that selective thinning of taking one and leaving half type of thing. So just if the tree, if it forks out or if it's clumped at anything higher than like a uh, foot off the ground, 
that's that's you're either going to keep the entire clump or you're going to cut the entire clump. I can ask one more question. Sure. Um, you you mentioned cutting the cutting the tree and then you, you've got an, an open end. Can you and this goes back to your your uh, points on the uh, fungus and the cancers that are growing on the trees. Like that? <laughs> yeah, that's bad. But like, for, for instance, those ones that have a big open hole in them. Yeah. Okay. And that fungus will spread throughout the forest. Oh, okay. you, the Utapella canker. Sorry? The Utapella canker. Yeah. So even like, if you if you do cut a maple or you have that, is there not something you can put on it? Not just in my mind, I'm thinking like, I gotta take those trees out of there. But because I've got such a huge project ahead of me, can I take like wood end sealer or put something on it just to stop it from spreading until I get to cutting it? No, it's in fact that whole idea of sealing over a wound with like they used to have tree tar, yeah. uh, that's that's completely out. The arborists don't use it anymore. The best thing you're going to do if you're going to do any kind of pruning is to give it a nice clean cut as close to the bowl as you can, as the stem as you can, and, and then make sure the water drains off of that. If the tree is vigorously growing, it should seal over that wound. But if you put the tar on there, you're going to keep it moist behind there, and that's actually attracting fungal infection as opposed to preventing it. And I think you've been the opposite. Can you paint the canker yeah, to right. keep the stem? No, there's, there's, until you cut it out. There's, there's no stopping the canker now. It's like there's no stopping the work that it has to work. But if you do have a canker and you cut it out, um, turn it upside down so that the base of the canker is on the, facing the soil. Basically, if you got a canker, cut it. I, I've only got about four minutes left, so I'm going to do this quickly. But here's some examples of, uh, of high-risk trees. Um, you, you, you've all got them. You look at this tree uh, on the right-hand side, it's a great tapper. But half its crown is damaged, it's got a huge need to keep that. So you're going to look at the tree next to it and see is that a better choice to keep uh, uh, as a keeper. If it's got fungal conch growing on the side of it, that's a pretty easy cut. And then on the one on the left hand side, it's got a high crotch. Um, it's not so bad, but when I look around, I got a lot of other trees that are in way better condition than that one. So that becomes a choice. I know the hardest thing for any maple producer to do is cut out a maple tree. But honestly, when you think about how many maple trees you actually need, you, you've got to cut some maple trees in. So here's a little, uh, we'll just wrap up now. Here's an example. Uh, I don't know if you can see this. Here's the bush before. Uh, it, it was a, basically a clear cut patch. Uh, all of maple sprouted up. I had to make some choices as to what my crop trees are going to be. You can see I designated some in blue and other trees to be removed in yellow. I risk managed. These two trees are close together, but they're both very good trees and there was no other trees adjacent, so I'm going to keep them both at least for a while. But they both have their own root system. They're not one of those joined at the, at the base kind of thing. Uh, in this part of the world, we have lots of ironwood, we've got lots of balsam fir. That's an easy, just get rid of all of that stuff out of your sugar bush. It doesn't exist, that doesn't belong there. And even if you try to eliminate balsam fir and ironwood from your plant, your, you're not going to do it. It's going to come back, but at least you're getting rid of it to give that maple tree growth advantage at the time you need to. Good question. Sorry, sorry. I just got to finish because I, the next one starts, and you guys got to get to the next one. Uh, just here's some great examples of the kite kind of crowns that you're looking for. That's why I like leaf off condition. You can see the whole thing. So this tree, that tree, that tree. They're probably slightly closer than 24 feet together. But the point is they all have room for their crowns to grow. Maybe 15 years from now, I would be taking out that one to leave the other two behind. But that shows you what you're trying to achieve. And then uh, one final slide. Uh, this is this was going to be a test for everybody, but I think you get it now. Uh, cut or keep? Uh, okay. Cut or keep? Uh, okay. Uh, which one of these two would you keep? Uh, keep the one right. There you go. Perfect. Okay. We've got time for one question. Oh, you mentioned ironwood. Yeah. Um, you, if you're. I don't want to make this sound bad, but like if I'm not, I mean, I want biodiversity, but I want my maples. And yeah. my maples are 
you know, I'm, I'm pressed for maples at the moment. So, but I do have, like, there's a ton of ironwood growing in here, and I am trying to leave the odd ironwood for, like, a tension tree or something like that. But um, to leave, like, you, you say, get rid of the ironwood, like, just grow the leaves. Yeah. Um, so is it, it, it leaving that ironwood sporadic throughout the, the bush? Go forward or get rid of them? No, I, 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 I've got a perspective on ironwood. I used to have a vendetta against ironwood. <laughs> but because they got so much ironwood, I now look at some and go, oh, that's a nice ironwood. So you can leave ironwood. Uh, ironwood has seeds that grouse love to eat, you know, so, but the point is, you don't need 10,000 ironwood per, per acre, you need maybe four. So you got you got to cut some trees at some time. So Andrew, you have to cut you cut 100%? Yeah, I, I did have it in the slide. A beach around here is 100% cut right now while you still can because beach bark disease is coming. You've got about two years from the time the tree is infected before it just disintegrates on its own. So it becomes unsafe to cut once it's heavily infested. Ash is in the same category. Ash is pretty much a goner because of the introduced insect. So those two, anything that's got an insect lined up to take it out, you may as well take it out while you're there. And then there's another question over here. Yeah, Mr. about do you remove all logs that are down, like all trees that are down? Do you leave some for decomposition? Yeah, absolutely. It depends. If you've got a little market for your firewood, uh, just get them out of your way. Get them out of your pipeline. Get them off your trail system. Just lop the, the, the branches down to the ground so that you've got them out of your way. Because I'll cut them out. The flip side of that is if you got a lot of deer in your area, deer love moving into an area that's been recently cut because they love the fresh regeneration. So what they do in the United States where they've got way more deer than us is when they drop a big tree, they don't even uh, loft the crown down, they leave it as this big, huge, ugly thing, which is like a deer barrier. So that some maple growing in that crown will be able to get up through the deer browse. One last question, Terry. Is there any truth to the rumor that maples prefer yellow birch? Uh, so there are compatible species, and depending on where you are, yellow birch, basswood, ash was a good companion species, hemlock was a good companion species for, for maple, because they kind of share the same, and beech was also always found with me. But yellow birch tends to indicate a slightly moister site. So that might be where you find more red maple than sugar maple. And once you get into a pure, the yellow bird site, you're probably too wet for uh, ideal sugar maple growth. But that's that's Woodlot Mansion 301. So I got to get you guys out of here because the next one's at. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you.